All right. Good morning. There we go. Yes. Roger's awake. Good morning to all of you online that are watching. We just had an awesome time of worship and communion. So we are already kind of pumped up, I think. Some people might be still sleeping out there. But Roger's awake. So, all right. I'm going to start with prayer, and then we're going to uh, get into uh, this uh, Bible study. Let's pray. Lord God, we just come before you. We thank you so much, again, for who you are. And uh, Holy Spirit, I just ask that you will just um, speak through me. Um, just, uh, I just want to just be a vessel for you and do what you do. We love you. We praise you. We serve you. We ask you in Jesus' name. Amen. Dropped my hat, and I didn't want to get it during prayer. All right. Good morning. So um, this morning I'm going to um, talk about uh, some doctrines of the Pentecostals. But before I do that, um, something happened this week. I was watching a video, and I can't remember. I wish I couldn't even go back to the video because I couldn't remember which video I was watching. But the video had a really high percentage of most American Christians. If you were to ask them to explain the gospel... They couldn't do it. And I was thinking about that, and I thought, if that high of percentage couldn't explain the gospel, how many Christians don't know how to truly study their Bible? Um, so, and then if we do know how to study it, do we study it? So I kind of wanted to talk about that a little bit this morning. Um, First, I want to, the gospel, we make it sometimes complicated, but it's really simple. And I wear this bracelet, so that way if somebody asks me, I'm like, ready. And black is for sin, so we all fall, fail, sin, mess up, make mistakes. So we all deserve death, but because we deserve death, God sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins, to take that punishment for us. And then blue is, resembles repentance. So then once we realize that, we ask God for forgiveness and we turn away from our sin. So then white means he cleans us up. Green means we continue to grow in Christ through being discipled, through studying his word. And then when we die, we have eternity in heaven. I'm sorry about that. There's, there's the bracelet. So anyways, um, I always wear that. So that is the gospel. And... Um, there is a false gospel going around, unfortunately, where they forget about repentance. But that is the most important part, because without repentance, you don't have salvation. Um, so, second most important part. Most important part is the Jesus part, where he died on the cross for our sins, so excuse me. But the second is the repentance part, turning away. Um, there's two parts of studying. We got doctrine and we got theology. So doctrine is teaching or instruction. So that's the doctrine. Theology is the study of God or understanding of God and his relationship with humankind. That is theology. Um, then there's hermeneutics. Anybody ever heard of the term hermeneutics? Hermeneutic. So hermeneutics comes from the Greek word. I am totally going to crucify this Greek word, but it's hermeneuo. Yeah, I don't speak Greek. That means to interpret, translate, or explain. Hermen, hermeneuo. Do you know how to say that? Or am I no? Uh, is related to Hermes. In ancient times, the Greek thought Hermes was a messenger of their gods. His job was to deliver and interpret divine messages. So hermeneutics is the study of principles for interpreting the Bible. So when you study the Bible, you study the Bible within its context. Because you might read somewhere where it says don't eat meat, and you read another place where it says, hey, it's okay to eat different kinds of meat. And then, and then some people will say, well, see, the Bible contradicts itself. And nowhere in the Bible does it contradict itself. That's the amazing part about the Bible. Um, but you have to read it within its context of what was going on then, what was meant by this. And you read it for the whole part, not just 
pick out a verse here and a verse there. So studying the Bible, we have to study it in its whole context. Another thing I'd like to explain is there's different kinds of translations of the Bible. So there is word-for-word translation, and there's thought-for-thought translation. And thought-for-thought translation is somebody takes paragraphs and interprets it, and they have like a committee of people. Most times when they interpret the Bible into another language or even interpret it from one English to another English, and we have a a lot of different versions of the Bible, is that um, they'll usually have a committee and they take paragraphs and, and then they... This is what they maybe study some Greek and Hebrew and like this is what they think it means. And then there's word for word where they just take it from Greek and Hebrew and translate it the best that they can into that language. Uh, Greek and Hebrew, like English doesn't have all the words for the Greek and Hebrew. Or Greek and Hebrew doesn't have all the words for the English translation. So they do the best they can, but they do word for word. And I have, I used to use the New Living Translation a lot and I have nothing wrong with the New Living. I still use it occasionally. But that is a thought for thought, and I like to stick more to the word to word translations. Um, so actually, recently I started using this is just a personal preference, but recently I just started using the CSB, um, the King James Version Bible, the New King James, the English Standard, the CSB, the New American Standard. Those are word for word translations. Um, New Living, NIV, um, the Message, and all those are thought to thought translations so yeah so that is um, when you study the Bible I would encourage to uh, get uh, a commentary Um, this is the one that pastor actually uh, I think you got this for me actually and it is called the believers Bible commentary I use it I use it I'm, uh, I'm actually using it more and more um, but it like the commentary just kind of breaks down verse by verse and kind of gives you the kind of history and the full context of it and different things. So it's extremely helpful. And then I have another study Bible, and I like this one because this one is more for the charismatics and kind of interprets it um, and doesn't leave out certain things that uh, a non-charismatic would leave out, I guess, the best way. But this Bible, this study Bible that I use a lot is called the Spirit-Filled Life Study Bible. And uh, I really like it. It's, it's got uh, notes at the bottom, and then it kind of talks, and it breaks down all these different things, and it, it explains them from a charismatic point of view. So, yeah. So I got those. I always talk, I've always i talked to the youth group about this uh, a couple times. I always try to encourage them to study the Bible, to read the Bible, show them how to study the Bible. And so when you get a study Bible and you understand the, the, how they translate the Bible and the difference between doctrine and theology and hermeneutics. Look into all that stuff on your own because it's really um, kind of the beginning of my sermon because um, I'm going to be talking kind of about the going to skim through the 16 doctrines of the Pentecostal, but I just kind of wanted to how we get there <laughs> and what doctrines are. So I wanted to explain that. So... Um, yeah, so I'm going to go through the 16, and I'm going to emphasize on some, and some I'm going to skim by. Um, I got some handouts to when I get to a certain spot, because uh, it's kind of, I didn't really have a ton of time, and I didn't want to make a whole sermon out of it, so I got a handout to, uh, uh, on, on one of them, so I'm excited. So, yeah, let's get going. Buckle up. Hang on. All right, number one, we believe that God, this is the inspired word of God. Um, it talks about in um, 2 Timothy three sixteen through 17 it says all scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching and for rebuking for correcting, for training and in righteousness so that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work we believe that this was written by um, the apostles, but it was completely God-breathed, God-inspired. There's absolutely no error in the Word of God. And we believe it from beginning to end. <laughs> um, God-inspired, uh, God-breathed. Um, uh, let's see here. So, God... 
uh, falling in love with Jesus, I'm just going to go into this and then it will lead into what I want to talk about with that. Falling in love with Jesus means wanting to be with him, hearing his words in the Gospels, and listening to his heartbeat through the rest of the Bible. Studying the Bible as God's personal love letter to us is a blessed experience. This word is God's love letter to us. The whole thing is about Jesus. It's not about us. It's about Jesus. It's what he did for us. He, uh, he, the Old Testament talks about how there had to be laws that we had to fulfill to be forgiven because um, we sinned. We messed up with the fall of man, which I'm going to get into that later. But uh, the New Testament is how God sent his son to die on the cross for our sins. And, um, and how he leads us from that into a relationship with us. And he explains his relationship through that. So, the word inspired means God breathed into. God breathed scripture into the biblical writers. All scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. So that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work, which is what we just read. So, we believe first that it is um, God inspired. Uh, number two, we believe in the one true God. There's one God in three person, in three beings, I guess, so to speak. Trinity is always hard to explain. I don't really thought I'm getting into that right now. But we believe that there's three in one. <laughs> like the egg. You got the egg, you got the yolk, you got the, the white part. Um, but it's still one egg. So we got the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and God the Father. So we believe in one true God in 1 Timothy 2.5. It says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, a man, Christ Jesus. We believe in one God. Number three, the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Deity. I looked that up and it means the creator and supreme being is what the deity is. So we believe in the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ, and he is our creator, and our, he is our supreme, he is our God. He is, he is, he's more than just, you know, a lot of people, I try to, I see them, and they, they talk about how God is our best friend, and he is kind of our best, he is our best friend, but he's our God. He's the God over everything. He's the God over us, and we should be completely and totally surrendered to him, and he is the creator and ruler of everything. God is always in control, no matter what circum stance or situation you're in, God is always in control. Um, so the deity. We see that in Genesis 1. He created the whole world. <laughs> and he wants to have a relationship with you. How awesome is that? And then we screwed it up and then he even fixed it. So we could still have a relationship with him. That's love. Amen? Let me show you all still awake. <clears throat> the fall of man. Adam and Eve. So... Uh, uh, Satan, he entered a snake. He talked to him. That was always kind of weird to me. Like, why would you listen to a talking snake? <laughs> but they did. But I guess if a snake talks, you're going to listen, I guess. Um, but anyways, he came to Eve. And um, he was like, hey, eat the apple. She ate the apple and talked Adam into it. And uh, that was the downfall of man right there. And... Uh, if uh, I always say that if they didn't screw up, somebody would have along the way. Because we are always curious. And uh, he said, don't eat this one tree. Why not? <laughs> right? And they ate it. And that was the beginning of not doing what God asked him to do, which was sin. Um, Ashley always explains sin is anything that breaks God's heart, makes him sad, is considered sin. John 3.16, number five, is the salvation of man. We believe in the salvation of man. God died on the cross for our sins. When we accept that, receive that, and turn away from our sins, and confess it with our mouth, he forgives us. And that starts an awesome relationship with him. And I always say, so um, one thing we learned through, uh, uh, I wanted to say quite a fire. It wasn't quite a fire. It was... Uh, uh, Dare to Share. We used to go to a youth conference every year, Dare to Share, and they always said that salvation starts now and lasts forever. 
Salvation isn't just by your insurance. Salvation is every day. We, we um, have that relationship with God. He works in and through each and every one of us on a constant basis if we allow him to. And um, so the salvation of man. Number six, ordinances of the church, uh, baptism, communion. We believe in water baptism. We believe in the Holy Spirit baptism. And we believe in communion. We took communion this morning in remembrance of what Jesus did for us on the cross so we don't forget. And so we don't get uh, into our own everyday life. And sometimes we forget things and communion just brings us back to that. that this is what Jesus did for us. Number seven, baptism of the Holy Spirit. Luke uh, chapter 3, verse 16 says, John answered them all, I baptize you with water, but one is coming who is more powerful than I. Woo! I am not worthy to untie the strap of his sandals, and he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And then we see in Acts chapter 2, um, we don't, we're not going to read that whole chapter. Um, I forgot to tell you, you didn't have to put it on the computer, so hopefully you didn't, if you didn't, sorry. But we're going to skip that. But Acts chapter 2, we see where um, uh, Jesus, before he ascends into heaven, at the end of Matthew, and I think it's Matthew and Luke, when he ascends into heaven, um, he uh, says, hey, you know, go wait, you know, and my spirit is coming. Paraphrasing. So anyways, they go and they, they're praying in this room together. They're... Um, just having some Christian fellowship and praying and praying and praying and seeking God and the baptism of the Holy Spirit hits them and it talks about how there were tongues of fire and God gave them this boldness that they could go out and they preached the gospel and I always say that Peter um, he uh, just before that he was scared of dying with Jesus and he denied Christ three times and he turns around and after Jesus ascends into heaven and after he gets baptized with the Holy Spirit, he seemed not to really care what people thought of him. He went out and he just started preaching the gospel. And they heard him in different languages. And so um, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Uh, I kind of said this before. I was watching a video this week of... Um, I, was, I was raised Baptist. And um, I was watching a video this week. It ended up on... You know how when you go down the rabbit trail of YouTube... You click on one thing, and then before you know it, you're getting recommended all these other things. And then sometimes it recommends weird things, and you're like, what, what is that about? <laughs> like, um, but anyways, I, was, I, I got recommended, and I watched Rod Parsley. Anybody ever hear of Rod Parsley? He's a TV evangelist. I don't think he's as popular as he used to be, though. But back in the 90s, there was a humongous move of the Holy Spirit, and uh, he was preaching... And I love Rod Parsons' just enthusiasm and excitement. And I don't think I've ever seen a sermon of him, at least in the older days, where he doesn't get to the sermon without sweating. He sweats through every sermon. Um, but anyways, I got uh, this video recommended to me. And it was three Baptist pastors that got hit with the Holy Spirit through Rod Parsley. And like the music's going and he's getting all excited. And... He like hits them and they fall over and they, they come back up and they're, they're praying in tongues and I don't know I just I enjoyed watching it it was fun uh, it's just uh, just the excitement he had and then the look on his face when they started praying in tongues he had like this this uh, what they just do kind of face and it was funny because uh, I was raised Baptist if you know anything about uh, most Baptists is um, tongues and and uh, being baptized with the Holy Spirit is not something that they're uh, I don't want to say they're not, they're not into tongues. They just have a different idea of everything. They, they interpret it just a little bit differently. Um, so, yeah, so to see, like, I think two of them were like Southern Baptists. And Southern Baptist pastors are really not into the move of the Holy Spirit. And two of them got hit with him, and they got up and started praying in tongues. And it was amazing. But anyways, baptism of the Holy Spirit, when it hits you, it hits you. And it's amazing. And um, we were believing God four moves like that again. Can you imagine people just coming to church, coming forward, and you're praying over them, and they're being just pretty much just hit with the Holy Spirit. How amazing. So anyways, number eight, and then the initial physical evidence of the baptism 
of the Holy Spirit, and we believe that tongues is, um, right? We believe that tongues, I want to make sure, <laughs> like, I believe, I want to make sure, sorry about that. But anyways, uh, baptism of the Holy Spirit, the, the original, the, the evidence of being baptized of the Holy Spirit is praying in tongues. And uh, we definitely believe that when you get filled with the Holy Spirit, tongues will be that sign. Um, I know I give my experience many times here, but like I said, I was raised Baptist. I was I've been going through school through the Assemblies of God back when I was 19, 18 or 19. I went to this thing called the Call Conference through the Assemblies of God, and it was for people that were going through this school, and it was like a weekend retreat thing. And I went, and I remember sitting down, and it was actually a missionary from Germany, and uh, he sat down in our circle. They broke everybody off into separate groups, and each group had a certain leader, and our leader ended up being a missionary from, from Germany. And he asked me, he says, have you ever been baptized in the Holy Spirit? And I remember looking at him going, well, I'm new to this whole spirit thing. <laughs> and he looked at me, and I said, well, I was raised Baptist, and I said, um, we never, we kind of always danced around those verses of praying in tongues and baptism. And, and uh, um, like I grew up being taught that the evidence of being filled with the Holy Spirit is boldness because Paul goes out and he's bold after he gets filled with the Holy Spirit. Um, but when you look, I think it's seven, I could be wrong because I, I didn't look it up for this because I didn't find about it. I think it's seven different times in the Bible where the tongues is revealing, right? Is it seven? We don't know. I don't know either, but I think it's seven different times in the New Testament where tongues was the sign of being filled with the Holy Ghost. And um, so, um, but they always dance around those. And if it says it seven times in the New Testament, the New Testament is not extremely big. So when it says it seven times, you know that there is an importance focusing on that evidence. There's a reason the Bible keeps repeating that. <laughs> and, and uh so anyways, I told him, I said, I, I'm new to that. And he said, well, I'm going to pray over you. And he says, he says, you may get it right now. And he says, you may get it later. But he says, just receive it when it happens. And he prayed over me. And he prayed that the Holy Spirit would fill me. And to be honest, I really didn't feel anything in that moment. It wasn't like all of a sudden I fell on the ground and rolled around and, and got up praying in tongues. It didn't happen to me. I'm not saying that that doesn't happen. That happens to a lot of people. But that's not how it happened to me. I actually was praying later that night in the bunk, and it just started coming out of my mouth. And at that moment, I still questioned it for many years until um, Scott Trendle and his wife were here when they first started coming to our church. I remember talking to him and saying, well, I think I have it, but I'm not sure. And so we have, he, uh, God used him to confirm it in my life. And uh, it's just, uh, I've been getting stronger and stronger since then. But... So we definitely believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We definitely believe in tongues uh, in, in here. And uh, as I say, number nine, sanctification. What is sanctification? Sanctification is free from sin and set apart for God. Being set free from our sin and we're set apart for God. At that moment, like I say, God is our God. He is the one that's in control. And we are set apart for him. To live for him follow him, and whatever God wants in our life comes before what we may want. <laughs> and God does change our desires into his desires. But sometimes it doesn't always happen instantly. I want a boat. My wife says no. So I don't have a boat. <laughs> um, but I've also learned that if my wife's not on board, more than likely, it's not God's timing or it's not supposed to happen. So God doesn't give me a boat. Because <laughs> my wife don't want a boat. Um, somebody gave me a free boat recently. My uncle. He says, I got a boat for you. I got to tell you this story. And I said, okay. I, so I come home to my wife and I said, we're getting a boat. The best part is, it's free. And she looked at me and she said, it's not free. And I said, yeah. Yeah, my husband said he's got the title in hand and I can just take it. It's free. And she says, you have to license it. She says, you have to fix it up. She says, you have to get the trailer license, which now in Illinois is $118. Thank you, Governor. And we, she starts putting all this stuff and she says, so it isn't free. And I was like, 
No, my uncle said it was a free boat. Like, it won't cost me to take it. <laughs> but anyways, I'm like, even if it sits in my yard for four years, it was free. <laughs> I didn't get the boat. Because um, she kept reminding me, we're not taking this boat. We're not taking this boat. So another friend of ours took it that's flipping it, and he flips boats. So, but anyways, sanctification, free from sin, set apart from God, living by God's desires, and doing what the Holy Spirit wants you to do. Uh, the church and its mission, our mission as a church is to grow in Christ and share the gospel. Uh, I'm not going to read it, but Matthew chapter 28 talks about um, how Jesus says to baptize and, and uh, witness. And actually, let us read it. I'm, I'm having a brain. I'm having a brain space. <laughs> the 11 disciples traveled to Galilee in the mountains where Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped, but some doubted. Then Jesus came near and said to them, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always, even until the end of the age. He sends his Holy Spirit, and he's with us always. So, um, we preach the gospel. Luke 6.40. A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will be like his teacher. And then Luke 9.23. Then he said to them, all of any wants to come with me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. The church mission is to share the gospel and make disciples. To make disciples, um, people um, come up under people that train them. And you teach them the Bible. We're all supposed to make disciples. So that means not just pastor and I, but that means each and one of us are supposed to make disciples. Like I said it earlier, we study God's word. We learn God's word. I'm still learning on a constant basis. And we learn, and then we teach what we learn. And then it says, to be God's disciple, though, you must pick up the cross and follow him daily. It doesn't mean life's going to be, you're, you're not going to get saved, and life's going to be this wonderful journey of everything happening just perfectly. <laughs> you're not always going to get the job you want. You're not always going to... Um, even times, you're going to go probably have some physical ailments in your life. Doesn't mean God won't heal you, but you're going to go through moments. And it's, um, but God is, is sovereign and he has a plan. And he's working in and through you if you let him. And um, so we grow in Christ, and we disciple, and we pick up our cross, and we follow him daily. And um, you may not always get the boat you want. And you may not always get the car you want, the job you want, um, but God will always provide, and God is always there. And I, uh, all throughout my life, because I was raised in church, I've heard testimony after testimony after testimony of missionaries that go to other countries, and their life isn't perfect. They have a lot of struggles, but God always provides at the right time for these missionaries. And... Um, so, uh, I think sometimes the American, I um, posted something on Facebook about a week ago, and I talked about how the gospel isn't a health and wealth gospel. The gospel isn't about, and I said that the, the gospel has kind of been Americanized, where we think God providing for us is giving us that brand new cell phone, <laughs> or giving us that because you need it, you know? You need more memory on your phone. You need 128 gigs, you know? Um, <laughs> I know, I'm being sarcastic. But uh, um, you need a brand new car, or you need this, or you need that. And um, the, the gospel that says live your best life now um, has been Americanized. That's the word I'm looking for. Because living your best life now is about being completely surrendered to Jesus Christ. 
that's living your best life now. And um, it's not about becoming, I, I feel like a lot of, especially if you watch a lot of TV evangelists, you start getting the idea that it's like a self-help kind of thing. And it's also like, you ever watch those, get those commercials on YouTube or whatever, where it's like, you do this and you're going to make thousands of dollars. You're going to make $100,000 a month if you do this. And I feel like that has become the gospel of America. If you do this, and God is not our genie, you cannot rub God a certain way to get your way. That's just not the gospel. But here's what it is. The gospel, like I said, is God is dying on the cross for our sins. We receiving that, him changing us. And then it is being completely surrendered to Jesus Christ. That is your best life now. Because if we were to go by the gospel version of your best life now, what do you say to Paul, who was crucified upside down? Or who do you say to Stephen, who was stoned to death? Right? But it was their best life because they were completely and totally surrendered to Jesus. I'm almost done. I promise. All right. Ministry. We are all in ministry. Um, each and every one of us are the priesthood. And if you are saved, you're in ministry. Maybe not in front of a church ministry, but you're in ministry. And we should always be sharing the gospel with our friends, our family. We should, um, like I said, we, we should be in God's word. And as we get in God's word more and more, we're going to become more and more excited about what we're studying. That's just the way it is. As you study God's word more, you fall more in love with God's word. And then what used to be a sacrifice to take 10 minutes away, 10 minutes a day to study that, now you can't wait to get in the Bible to study that. And so it grows on you and becomes more and more. And then it turns into where you're not a morning person. And all of a sudden you find that the only time you have a study of God's word is 6 a.m. But you want to because it's exciting. And you're learning some awesome things. And the Holy Spirit's moving in through you and, and teaching you things. And so you find yourself getting up at 6 a.m. and studying God's word. Um, so we're always in ministry. The Bible says always be ready to give an answer. I didn't have that written. I don't have that passage written down, but it, there's this part of the Bible where it says, always be ready to give an answer. We're always in ministry. Divine healing. Uh, we believe in divine healing. We, we believe in healing. Sometimes, uh, like I said, God is sovereign and there's a reason for everything. So sometimes we don't always know the reason we're not getting healed in that moment, but there is a reason. And, and we believe in divine healing. We anoint people and pray over people and the Bible says, laying on hands and putting, you know, anointing people with oil and praying over them and believe. And so we believe, and so we pray for healing for people, and we believe it. Period. <laughs> Period. Um, so um, I didn't, I, I have, um, I'll hand out some handouts afterwards about that. Um, but I have, uh, the school I'm going through had a section on divine healing, and I thought it was really good because it talks about how we believe in healing. Then it also talks about when it doesn't happen, why it doesn't happen. And it gives some points of some reason, sometimes why it doesn't happen. And so I'll hand those out afterwards. So divine healing. Uh, we believe in the blessed hope, which is salvation and Christ's return. We believe in Christ's return. God is coming back. And then... 14, we believe in the middle, millennial reign of Christ. He's going to come back. He's going to reign for a thousand years. And with everything going on, we may be getting closer and closer and closer to that time. That should be exciting. We're living in exciting days. You know, we've got to quit watching the news and just start reading the Bible because we win at the end. We may have some hard times before then, but we win at the end. And that's the most amazing part. So we believe in the middle reign. We believe in the final judgment. There will be a final judgment. And that is another reason why we should share the gospel with as many people as we can. Because there is coming a final judgment. And if that person doesn't know Jesus, they will not spend eternity in heaven. Period. I know that's not part of the gospel that we want to talk about sometimes. But it's true. That if you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior... You will spend eternity in hell. No matter how good you were. No matter how bad you were. <laughs> no matter what. Because praise God that he doesn't go by our good works. <laughs> you know? 
Uh, uh, you, can't, you can't lose your salvation. You can give it up, but you can't lose your salvation. If you completely deny Christ and turn away from him, um, you can give up your salvation, but you cannot lose your salvation. Nothing can take that from you when you're in Jesus Christ. Um, and then we believe in the new heaven and a new earth. After the millennial reign, he allows Satan back out of his prison of hell, goes around tempting people, and then after that, um, there will be a new heaven and a new earth, and we will live for eternity with Christ on this, with this new heaven and new earth. You guys excited about that? Yeah? Or are you guys more excited than I'm done? <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> but, um, but anyways, um, as we close, um, I do want to encourage you guys to, to get deeper into God's Word. Um, I, I start asking God to give you, to help you fall deeper in love with Him and His Word. Because you, God, this is, we, we can't fall deeper in love with Jesus and not get into His Word. Because this talks about Jesus. This is getting to know Him. <laughs> And you can't, it's like you can't date somebody and never get to know them. And you got to say you're falling deeper in love with them. How can you fall deeper in love with somebody you don't know anything about? <laughs> so I really encourage you to start praying that God helps you fall deeper in love with him and deeper in love with his word. And I don't think we could ever be enough in his word and enough in love with him. So we are constantly growing as human beings. And we are constantly moving, hopefully moving forward as human beings. And uh, falling deeper in love with Jesus. So... Uh, this morning, um, I just want to close. Uh, I don't know if there's a song you could play or if you still have music up there from like when we did uh, the uh, um, communion or whatever. Um, but I just want to have just a moment to where I give you that are watching online or you, uh, you guys here, just a moment. If you have um, never accepted Christ to 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 have a chance to do that. And if you have accepted Christ, um, but you've never been baptized with the Holy Spirit, we need the Holy Spirit. Especially going into these times we're going into, we need the Holy Spirit. He empowers us. He gives us wisdom. And we need the Holy Spirit. And so if you want to get baptized with the Holy Spirit, you can come forward and pastor. I can pray for you. And, um, and then, um, uh, just... Maybe you have been baptized in the Holy Spirit. Maybe you just need to fall more in love with God in His Word. And I just want to give you that moment just to, to seek God in this moment and to ask Him. Um, so, yeah.
for those of you watching online, I, I just want to uh, say that uh, salvation is as simple as realizing that we have messed up. We are sinners. And saying a prayer and asking God to forgive us of our sins and asking him to become the Lord of our life. And he forgives us immediately. So I want to share that. Um, and I just want to close in prayer. Lord God, we just come before you. And I just ask that as your people, that you will help us fall deeper and deeper and deeper, God, in, in love with your word. Teach us to study your word. And help us to fall deeper and deeper in love with you through studying your word. I ask that studying your word won't become a religious thing, but it will become a relationship thing. And I pray for each and every person that is watching online again that also they will continue to fall deeper in love with you and your word. And if anybody is seeking the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I ask Holy Spirit that you will hit them right now where they're at. And I ask that uh, they will just start uh, praising you and worshiping you, Lord God, with tongues. We love you, God. We praise you. We serve you. And we ask you all in Jesus' name. Amen. I thought of this about potatoes and some onions out there. I don't know why it's taking. There's potatoes and onions at the door. Take what you want. Mix them together. Have potatoes and onions. There's lunch. Sorry, I'm lying. You can't have no potatoes and onions. That's all. <laughs>